life lived in poverty is about scrambling. Poverty is hunger, lack of education, lack of medical attention. Poverty is when you lose your child due to unclean water. Cursed with poverty, people, and these are not just people, these are our relatives, cousins, um, friends, friends of our friends, people who are just a mere handshake away in this global network that we are connected in, often squander opportunities, not because they are lazy, but because they can't see them. The latest statistics says that 13.8 South Africans live in extreme poverty. 13.8. So this means that if we take this auditorium, that takes about 200 people. 50 of those people in this room live under extreme poverty. Half of the world's population lives under $2.5 a day. We are so immune to poverty that we are so used to poverty that we are so immune to the consequences that it has in society. The World Bank gives us statistics that 9% uh, South Africa spends on, on its GDP towards primary health care. 9%. Its comparative, uh, comparable peers, they spend about 6% of their GDP towards primary health care. But the outcome uh, that South Africa ranks about 119 out of 195. So we spend more on primary health care, but the result is less. The same goes with education. We spend about 88% of our GDP on education. But the output gives us about 137 out of 139 countries in the quality of our education system. This pattern of aggressive spending and disappointing returns is not only limited to South Africa. In the United States, they spend more or less per capita on primary health care, more than their peers, but they also rank lower than their peers. They also spend the same on education, right? and they rank about 24 out of 25 uh, on maths literacy tests in comparison to their OECD counterparts. So as you can see, the problem is not money. The money is there. Okay? Uh, the problem and the solution lies elsewhere. So what are we going to do about this? As an entrepreneur uh, and somebody who has been studying various entrepreneurship models for over 10 years, I'm convinced that the answer lies in innovation. More specifically, innovation for social change. You see, there are three types of innovations. There's sustaining innovation, there's disruptive innovation, and that's what we call catalytic innovation. Sustaining innovation basically improves on the current solutions that we have. So it does not really create new markets. Right? It's merely augmentation of improvements of existing features, therefore meeting the needs of the current customers. An example of a sustaining innovation would be Apple's uh, upgraded features on their iPhones, iPhone 6, iPhone 7, iPhone 8. Okay. Disruptive innovation, on the other hand, creates new markets by offering simpler, accessible, um, and affordable products, therefore creating a new market. A classic example of a disruptive innovation would be Henry Ford's Model T. Okay. Through mass production, Henry Ford was able to democratize and make a car which was very expensive to a lot of people, affordable and accessible. You see, before uh, Model T, cars were the rich man's toys. Right? It was only available to the elites, um, kings and queens. By democratizing, I mean making accessible social services to thousands and thousands of people who could not afford those services before at a sustainable manner. Okay? A, a recent example of a disruptive innovation would be our low-cost airliners that are providing cheaper, affordable, no-frills flights, making it accessible to thousands of people who could not afford to fly before. I would like to introduce another form of innovation called catalytic innovation. What is catalytic innovation? Thank you for asking. 
Catalytic innovation offers simpler, more convenient, less expensive products, but it focuses more on social change. Catalytic innovation shares the same traits as disruptive innovation. Actually, catalytic innovation is a subset of disruptive innovation. Okay? At the core of it is how do we democratize social services to more people? Okay? It shares about five qualities. Okay? One, are you creating a systemic social change through replication and uh, scaling? In other words, are you able to address a social issue in a manner that you are reaching thousands and thousands of people? Two, are you meeting the unserved needs of the market? Three, are you offering simpler, affordable, good enough products? Four, are you able to generate resources, donations, grants, um, volunteer manpower, intellectual capital? And lastly, these types of innovations are often ignored or disparaged by the existing players. So let's look at ex um, entrepreneurs who have been able to actually apply catalytic innovation successfully. People walking into a well-resourced primary health care in a shanty town of Deep Sloot, which caters about 1 million people, 40, 50 kilometers away from Johannesburg, are not used to the quality primary health care and being attended to when they enter into the facility. Often, when you have to go to a clinic, you have to take a, you have to take a day off from work because you know you're going to spend the whole day at the facility. This has been the case for a long time until Dr. Ntavise Lehwete decided to do something about it. In May 2016, Dr. Lehwete opened Quali Health. Quali Health is a social enterprise that aspires to provide primary quality affordable health services to marginalized communities in South Africa. Within six months of opening, Quali Health was profitable and seeing over 3,000 patients a month. Is Quali Health a catalytic innovation? Let's test it. One, is it meeting social or creating social change? Providing primary health care to a lot of people actually does influence the social fabric of a community. Is it scalable and replicable? Over and above the clinic that Quali Health has in Deep Sloot, they have opened three additional clinics in uh, uh, marginalized communities of Tembisa, Bramfisha, and Alexander. And that actually gives them access to thousands and thousands of people who cannot afford private uh, health care. Does it meet the unsafe needs of the market? 80% of South Africans don't have medical insurance. 80%. Quali Health aspires to save that market. Is it simpler and affordable? Pep smear or circumcision at Quali Health costs about 250, which is about $25. A general practitioner in Johannesburg charges about 500 rands, which is about $50. And this is just on consultation alone. Okay. Is it able to uh, generate resources, donation grants? Dr. Le Huete has been able to, through her own private funding, uh, raise additional funding from other financial institutions. Is it ignored or disparaged? Often people don't even think of going to a township for primary health care. Right? I believe that Dr. Lehuete has been able to democratize access to primary health care to thousands of people who could not actually afford to. Let's look at another example. Uh, this time, let's go to East Africa, Kenya. Often when we give examples of uh, startups or entrepreneurs who started from humble beginnings. We talk about startups that started from a garage, and we often use examples of Apple, Microsoft, Harley Davidson. In Nairobi, having a house with a garage is a luxury. Lots of entrepreneurs don't have garages where, when they want to tinker or build prototypes. Meet Dr. Kamau Gachiki. Dr. Kamau Kachiki is a lecturer, an engineering lecturer, and he's always challenged himself to not only produce engineers, but also challenge those engineers to make things. And as a result, he has started an organization called Gearbox. Gearbox is a nonprofit organization 
that provides workshop space with benches, machines, and tools to entrepreneurs who could not actually afford to access those facilities. Gearbox, since 2013, has been able to house over 2,000 entrepreneurs. Is Gearbox a catalytic innovation? Let's test it. Does it create social change? The fact that you're creating entrepreneurs, it means you are able to provide jobs, create jobs, and actually uh, alleviate people from poverty. Is it scalable and replicable? The fact that you are able to provide a, 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 an accommodation where you house thousands and thousands of entrepreneurs, it means that you are able to access uh, people who actually need that facility. Is it simpler and affordable? Gearbox charges about $50 a month to use their facilities. An entrepreneur who wants to run his own workshop would most probably spend about $200 a month on accessing a workshop. And this is without machinery and tools. Okay. Is it resourced? Uh, Dr. Kajiki has been able to actually raise funding locally and internationally. Is it, is it ignored and disparaged? Often entrepreneurs want to have their own luxury offices and spaces. The thought of sharing space with others is often looked down upon. I'm convinced that Dr. Kajiki has been able to democratize access to working space to thousands of entrepreneurs who could not afford to. Let's go to another example, uh, this time West Africa, Nigeria. Access to, education in, uh, access to higher education in Africa has proven to be a challenge. Fees must fall movement in South Africa is a classic example of students who are frustrated by high fees that they cannot afford. Meet Gosi Okwanukwe. Gosi started Beni American University in Nigeria, the first online university in, in Nigeria. You see, in Nigeria, there are about 2 million students fighting for about 500 spots in about 141 accredited universities. This leaves about 1.5 students who can't get in. Since 2014, BAU has been able to graduate over 8,000 students and boast about 2,000 students who are currently registered at the moment. Is BAU a catalytic innovation? Let's test it. Is it creating social change? The fact that you are able to provide education to students, it means that you are actually giving them the tools so that they can get a job and live a better life. Are you meeting unserved needs of the market? 1.5 million students can't get into university, either because it's not affordable or because there's no space enough for them. Is it simpler and affordable? Because you're not paying for a bricks and mortar or a physical lecture standing in front of you. You're able to save a lot of money. And as a result, BAU has been able to provide their courses at $50 per course. Traditional universities in Nigeria charges the same course at $250 a course. Is it scalable and replicable? The fact that it's online, it means you are able to reach as thousands and thousands of students. What, in fact, BAU is doing is they are also uh, have building smaller centers in rural communities for students who don't have access to Wi-Fi to go to those centers and access laptop and free Wi-Fi, and they are able to uh, learn. Is it resourceful? Uh, Gosi has been able to, through his private funds and uh, other in potential investors, fund uh, BAU. Is it ignored or disparaged? Even today, people don't take online learning seriously. I'm convinced that uh, GOSI has been able to democratize quality education to thousands of students who could not afford to. This catalytical innovation model has been applied throughout the world in countries like Mexico, India, Bangladesh, and other emerging countries. At the core of this model is, are you creating a social change? Is it accessible and affordable? Is it scalable? Do you have the resources? And are you willing to be looked down at? Our challenge is not a, challenge, a lack of money. The money is there. It is about taking that money and redirecting it towards innovation with social impact. If we are going to alleviate poverty, we need to stop obsessing about building elite institutions that cater for the few and excluding the many. Henry Ford has shown us how to democratize and make accessible to thousands and thousands of people an elite product for an elite few. We need to be able to take the same principles and apply them for 
social change. We can apply this principle in uh, our providing micro-lending to startup entrepreneurs who can't afford business finance. We can apply this model to uh, providing quality legal services to poor communities who are being taken advantage of by corporates in their areas. We can apply this model to providing uh, social houses to people who can't access social grants or even uh, afford to access uh, home loans. Our success is not going to depend on whether we build elite institutions that charges exorbitant prices and in the process excluding a lot of people. It, has, it, is, it was going to be about are we able to provide quality services to people who really need it the most. The test of our progress is not whether we are able to add more to the abundance of those who have enough, but to be able to provide enough for those who have little. Hundred years ago, Henry Ford sat in an ideas conference like this. They were outlaying how the next hundred years is going to look like. He sat there taking notes. He knew what he was going to do after that conference. He was going to make a product for the masses and in the process make money. Fast forward 100 years to today, you are sitting in an ideas conference. You are taking notes. I hope that you will do something about all this. I hope you will succeed. Thank you very much. <laughs>